Okay, you're good. Hi, everybody. So I'm going to just show you a quick update from some of the work we have at the Virtual Manufacturing Lab. Some of you might already be familiar with our work, but maybe some have, are not as familiar. So we're, we're, we uh, won an O&R MEEP award, uh, and we're in tier two of the three-year project. And this is a collaboration between the Virtual Manufacturing Lab is a collaboration between MIT, Clemson University, and University of Arizona, uh, and we're in partnership with AIM Photonics Academy and ICHEM. Uh, and we're really trying to create digital content uh, for the Manufacturing USA Institutes. So the first two years of the project are focused on AIM Photonics and AFOA, uh, integrated photonics and and uh, fiber manufacturing, uh, and and uh, uses of, use cases of optical fiber. Uh, and then in year three, which is coming up this October, we're planning to branch out to the other MUSA institutes to go beyond optics and photonics and branch out to the other MUSA institutes. Uh, and so one, and currently the reason that we're, we're creating a lot of this content is we're going to be uh, uh, delivering it on the edX platform through standard MITx courses or through the Educate, Clemson University's Educate Workforce platform or through our new open edX platform. So a lot of this content is is being made to help our online learning efforts, uh, and we are and I'm actually about uh, in two weeks time <laughs> I'm going to be starting to uh, use some of these simulations in a te our technician training program our other own army award, and so we're doing that with Stonehill College and and BSU and so we're 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 actually putting a lot of our co digital content into uh, blended learning environments or or using it in our in our curriculum in the classroom so. That's also very exciting. So we're we're trying to support all of our other efforts across uh, the different programs, uh, and so mainly what we're focusing on are three different approaches to interactive digital content. We're creating uh, micron scale, like circuit level optics and photonics fundamental simulations, and if when we move beyond photonics, this might branch out into other areas. But like looking at like what's happening on the micro scale and helping people build intuition about things that you can't see with the naked eye. Uh, another thing is we're creating tool training, VR tool training si simulations. And normally what we're doing is we're doing desktop VR. So this is going to be widely accessible in browser, but you still have this 3D environment. You can explore the 3D, 3D environment. And so we're, we're, we're partnering with Clemson University to deliver those kind of like uh, procedural tools training simulations. But in addition, the, the third uh, category of our, of our simulations is uh, of, our, of our digital content is application-based educational games. So we're we're trying to uh, focus on the application areas of these technologies, gets people excited about like the end use case, and we're doing that using uh, digital games that allow uh, students to explore the the uh, the different applications of integrated photonics. So that for for our project right now, it's only focused on integrated photonics, but we hope to expand that to other application areas of different technologies in the future. And so today, I'm just going to focus on the third category, but just to give you a quick snapshot of the other two. So. We're creating these uh, uh, micron scale simulations and then desktop VR simulations. So uh, in a lot of ways, we're trying to make these uh, 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 symbiotic in that you can learn how to create an optical fiber, let's say, and then you learn the applications of that optical fiber. You learn the, the fundamental principles of that optical fiber. So as you're using, uh, as you're learning about optical fiber, you might then wonder how is that manufactured. You go and look at the fiber lathe and the fiber draw tower, and you can uh, kind of like go back and forth between these two different perspectives. Uh, so, but for the third category, this is where I'm really envisioning the games as being kind of a hook that brings people in. So we're we're making it so that you don't actually have to have any background knowledge to play the game. We're designing these games to be able to be played by undergraduates who are just getting into the field, or by graduate students, or by uh, even K-12 and and technicians. Like we're we're really making it so that it's approachable and accessible to a wide audience. And what the, one of the focuses of the games is to really make it so that we can like showcase the benefits of integrated photonics as a technology. So a lot of our games are, we're, we're designing them with an educational outcome where after you play the game, you kind of have an understanding, oh, when I use electric, when I'm gonna use copper wires from my data center uh, and then I upgraded to optical fiber, I had a large, I had a huge boost and and, and I, I was able to actually uh, take on more jobs. So, like, so in a lot of ways, we're trying to, uh, create like a, a motivational game, an educational game that uh, students can explore and play multiple times and then get an understanding of that, of those concepts. Uh, but in, in a, it, we're not really trying to make this like a course. We're more trying to get them motivated to want to learn more, to explore our other course offerings or our other simulations that we're creating. Uh, questions so far? Uh, 
So now I can just dive into how we're producing these games. So currently what we're doing is we are, uh, we have uh, at MIT, we have the MIT Education Arcade, and they have m many, many years of experience creating educational games and working on, on uh, like uh, research around learning games. And so we have two game designers, Rick and Ira, who are working on our, who are working on our games and uh, interviewing our subject matter experts and going through the whole process of trying to develop these games and make them both fun and educational. Uh, and we're contracting with an external uh, game studio, Firehose Games. They were actually an offshoot from MIT, so we have connections there. And so we are actually, they're handling the production of the game. So the game design is happening at MIT and the production is happening at Firehose Studios. And then we have a whole list of subject matter experts. So because we're part of AIM Photonics Academy and we're part of uh, ICAM, we have access to all of these different subject matter experts, both at MIT and at other, other institutions. And so we, we have uh, Madeline Glick from Columbia University, Catherine Schmidtke from Facebook weighing in, Nick Mass, uh, and we have, we have uh, 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 from like a commun community colleges, we have all sorts of different instructors or uh, industry partners who are advising, give, have, giving us interviews and allowing the game designers to get a like, firsthand uh, experience with like what's, what's going on, what are the, the relevant things to think about as, uh, for instance, for the, for, the, for the data center game, like what are the, the things that a, a CTO of a data center would actually be thinking about? <laughs> what are the things that different levels have to, have to be thinking about as they're making decisions within that environment? Uh, and so we're, we're, we're kind of going through a process where we uh, are, help, are trying to design this to be relevant to today's technology, but also to have some there's like fundamental learning goals that are going to be future-proof where you're learning about the properties of optics uh, as you play the games. So I'll just dive into like, what, so I'll, I'll go through the process that Rick Everhart went through, and these are his slides, uh, how he developed the hyperscale data center game. Uh, so we started with an objective. We kind of envisioned that students would be operating as the CTO of a data center, making decisions about when to upgrade their technologies. They might have visibility about like three years in the future, five years in the future here, the technologies that are coming down the road. We wanted to kind of be kind of a historical perspective, maybe uh, you'd like start off with uh, earlier technologies and then move to more advanced technologies as time went on. Uh, and so we really thought that students should be exploring the trade-offs between bandwidth, your ener the energy consumption, cost. So sometimes in the game, it might be worthwhile to invest in research and new technologies. Other times you might want to delay that and wait for it to become commercially available or on the market, and then you can get it cheaper. So, so we're really creating this very large dynamic space where students can explore uh, like different strategies and maybe even start to understand why companies do things the way they, they do it. <laughs> so so we, they might start to understand, even if they're not running a data center, if they're designing components for the data center, they might understand why uh, maybe like companies or data centers might choose to skip a generation of technology and move go, just wait for the more advanced technology to come down the road. So these types of interesting like dynamics are things that we're trying to allow the students to explore. Uh, and so at the same time, we're wanting them to really achieve like the, uh, to, to learn about uh, load, to learn about power consumption and cooling, and to learn about the main difference between having electronic and optical components. So for instance, if, they're, if they have copper wiring in their data center, we want them to understand that like that's uh, a low energy cost uh, uh, in the, in, like, uh, there's no upfront cost to having copper wiring, uh, energy cost to having, co having copper wiring, but as you, the longer your link length, the more energy that you're, it's going to be, it's going to be cost you more and more energy to transmit that signal. However, with optics and photonics, there's an initial upfront cost, but then after that, you just shoot light down an optical fiber or, or a, a waveguide on chip, and you basically get that distance for free. So if it costs a lot of money to, uh, to, uh, create that optical signal to create, to modulate that optical signal then it'll it that then it might not make sense for sh for short lengths to have optical fiber but as that cost comes down now it starts to make more and more sense to have even shorter and shorter lengths be trans uh, be converted over to optics and photonics uh, so that's this is the kind of thing the kind of like intuition where we uh, hope students will kind of build as they as they see like uh, as they're building out their data center and they're trying to, to navigate these different distances uh, and and in the and in the end we're not really Try this. The purpose of the game is not to say all of our students will now understand this fundamental concept. They can play the game multiple times and maybe start to grasp these things. But really, we're envisioning this as like bringing them in, making them excited and interested to learn more. And we are going to surround these games with videos from subject matter experts who might describe some of these things. So the next time they play it, after watching that video, they might say, "Oh, I see. I now understand a little bit about what's going on behind the scenes." 
so that's what, really what we're trying to do is trying to create kind of a fun and interactive environment where where they can we can spike their interest. So Eric, I have a quick question for you. Um, how much yep. time does a player on average spend playing the game to get to a goal? Is it envisioned that it would be something they do mm -hmm. within the time frame of a two to three hour class or do they do it independently and they could they could achieve goals from like one hour to six hours if they're really into it? Yeah, so we're we're designing. So you can design different games to have different game loops. So like mm -hmm. the amount of time that you spend in one round, if you, if, you, if you will, like or completing the game once. <laughs> and so we we design our games to be completed within thirty to forty five minutes. Okay. Uh, and so there's some surround the introductory videos and some end videos. And so we're, we're we're really expecting this to be sort of a one and a half hour, I guess, uh, 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 it, like just just to be to be safe. It's like a one and a half hour time commitment. Uh, but yeah, we're we're we want also for this game we wanted to them to be able to play iteratively. Maybe the first time you go, you try it, you fail. You your 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 business model doesn't work out, and you end up like not. So you try again, and then yeah. you go through the second time, and maybe you uh, you get to the end, and you're like, oh, I achieved a certain objective, but you didn't like the the money that you made in the end as as uh, for your data center wasn't like a really good score. So you might try it again and try to optimize your strategy. Okay. Uh, okay. So yeah, we're we're definitely envisioning that they might come back to it and play it multiple times but yeah we're trying to make this so that it can be used within a class period uh we're going to deliver the content online in which case people might be doing it on their off hours maybe uh, like after school or after work but we also envision that this could be eventually used uh uh in the classroom or even in boots we could have this like be a setup that like mm. draws people to the table and like they might play it at a, at a booth and like uh, uh try it for 15 to 30 minutes and even if they don't complete the game, they kind of might be excited to, to explore this field. So yeah, uh, that's, that's something, yeah. Uh, and so just, and I'm gonna go quickly through this, but just to give you some uh, some ideas of what Rick, the game designer, went through. He's like, he was looking at the different uh, technologies that are available and the different uh, layouts, uh, the, the different rack switches and like edge switches. And he was going through all of these different uh, technologies in his research to come up with the game. Uh, and then he, uh, Throughout, uh, mo uh, so from starting in 2019 and then ending in 2020, he actually did a, quite a lot of research. He was only working 25% and then half time <laughs> on it, so he had a, a little bit of a lead up, and we weren't ready to develop the game yet. So this was a little bit of a longer schedule than normal. But he spent a lot of time interviewing subject matter experts and, and getting a feel for what the most important dynamic things are in the game. Uh, I also was involved in this. This was quite fun for me throughout that year. He just like played a bunch of games with us, <laughs> and he was thinking like city building games or. Like there's even an, an, a game about like Electropolis where you're expanding out your energy consumption. So he just found a bunch of games that were very similar in the, in the dynamics that he was expecting to use. Maybe even farming games where you're like, you can thinking of a server as like a farming out uh, computation, right? And so so he just t took a lot of games into account of like well, how they approached these types of problems and what game elements they had. So you can see a lot of thought when in, like Rick put a lot of thought into like exactly what he wanted to build. Uh, then he then he went through and, and analyzed. Uh, okay, how do like data centers, how do they visualize what's going on inside the data center? So he just looked at their, the user interfaces that they normally use, what they focus on, what elements they focus on in like day-to-day -day operation, or maybe even like elements that they focus on when they're discussing new technologies. Uh, and so th that was just to give him ideas of what, what the kind of interface might look like. Uh, and then he went through and did uh, paper prototyping. So we brought technicians and undergraduate students to campus back before COVID and he did like he just brought them to a table. He had like these index cards that he could switch out, so he could write, okay, here's your here's your uh, the the the, the floor space that you have, and you can build uh, racks, and you can you can populate them with servers. And so he just had this whole uh, system set up where that he could change. So he could have different versions of the game that he gives to different students, and kind of go through an iterative process to create create the. Uh, and by the way, this is, you don't always have to go through all of these steps. So he actually did a very thorough job, but you can do a lesser version of this and still end up with a great game. Uh, but he, he was just very thorough in, in kind of testing this out in digital pro and, and paper prototyping before he went to digital. Uh, so yeah, and he, he kind of discovered that people have like different strategies of, of uh, uh, scaling their data center up in like, you know, like having more powerful computers that you install or out by just increasing the number, the sheer number of computers. Like there's different, so he just wanted to make a space where people had different strategies that they could they, they could look at. And that they could, and so he was also trying to get a sense for like, how many jobs should you have available? Should you see the jobs coming down the line? 
Uh, so there, you can see there's a lot of there were a lot of elements that he was including into the game that he was trying to make make it feel realistic, but also maybe sweep a lot of things under the rug that didn't need to be there that weren't as important to be thinking about. Uh, and so suffice to say that we he he came up with a design that he was happy with. He then went through and did some digital prototyping. So he he worked with one of our software developers to come up with this kind of like uh, prototype that would just show, okay, here are the active jobs that you have, the technology you have. Like he just create like created a digital prototype and just saw if it would work in the digital format, and did a little bit more prototyping with and more user testing with that, and then. Uh, through iteration, he, we arrived at a, a specific design, and then I'm, I'm kind of just jumping through this. And then we went to uh, actually working with the, with uh, Firehose games. So once the prototyping was done, he knew what design he wanted. He can he could like start from scratch again and then build up from from the ground up the actual final product. So these are the the kind of screenshots of the final design that he was working on with the graphic designer at Firehose. Uh, and then here is is this is this is kind of like the uh, beta version of the of the game where you were able to see all of the different uh, components interacting, but it wasn't it, it wasn't in the final version. And now I get to show you we're we're not there we're not exactly there yet, but like this is still in the in the uh, development phase, and they're going to be polishing it in the next couple of months and with a release in June or July. But I can show you the current working version of the game. Uh, so you can see like we had the graphic designer uh, think about like okay, these are the jobs that you can accept. So you're you're as you're running your data center, you have these different tabs to look at. So you can look at what the what the jobs are, what they pay, how much energy and computational power they require, and what time the timing of that of those of those games, bandwidth needed, etc. Eric, can you uh, give an example of uh, a job? Just so, what are the sure. examples of jobs? Sure. So uh, here he has like you're hosting web content. <laughs> so so he and uh, right now. This is the first level, so this is all you can do. And in the future, you might have different jobs. Maybe you have like uh, you're hosting uh, like uh, a computation that needs to happen on your cloud uh, system. So, so in this case, you're just hosting web content. So it's it's much more like down like people need to access it and download it from external sources. But in the end, uh, you might have access to jobs later on that require uh, com like communication within the data center. So maybe you have like you want you want to have uh, People running simulations on your data center, and then that they would require that your the, the communication between the different servers be be more efficient, even and, and not so much care care about like upload and download times. So that so he's trying to make it kind of realistic in that like in the kind of like historical like these were this is what data centers did first, and then they moved on to, to become more of something else. So so uh, yeah, the, I, I think the the idea here is that he's trying to mimic real life. So you might like accept a certain job. And you might say, okay, this is the job I want to pursue. These are the these are the uh, things that I need to achieve. And then you have your your data center floor where you can add servers. And I, I'm not going to be able to do all the things because I don't have enough money. <laughs> but so you just uh, imagine that, like, as you choose what to do on year one, uh, and he, he I guess day one, he, he just he was making it days instead of years just to make it a little bit more approachable. But uh, you might choose what you want to do. And then uh, build out your the space, and then you have the ability to upgrade your technology. So if you have enough money, you could upgrade topology. But if you don't have enough money, you can just install switches, install cables, and now. And so all of this, all of this is allowing students to kind of explore like what are the different features, or what are what are the different decisions that a CTO of a data center might make. Uh, and so here you don't have any technology available yet, but uh, you can see that up coming down the road, there's different, like, so in this case, he's seeing, saying that like, okay, a different, an upgraded version of the copper wiring is gonna be available when it gets to the market. So you, he created this kind of uh, uh, assembly line style thing or, or, or just a uh, kind of treadmill style thing where these, you can pay ahead of time to, ex to research this technology before it comes to market but if you wait till it comes to market, then it's available for you to upgrade your your, your data center to. Uh, so you build this out. You uh, and I haven't played this recently, so I actually don't know what the best strategies are. <laughs> uh, and, but let's say that you end the day, and and you can you can see the summary of what happened that day, and then uh, later on you might have more jobs coming available. So you can choose which jobs you want to perform, 
And right now, I think I'm not doing a great job because I'm, oh, no, I, I did gain money. So, <laughs> so uh, what he's currently tweaking all of these designs and deciding which, which uh, jobs should be available when, what things you like, what strategies he wants to encourage and what she wants to dis discourage or just open it up to many different strategies that you can play with. So you can see that this is, this is a dynamic game where going through it once, you won't get all the information. You might want to play it again, but hopefully it's engaging and entertaining enough that people would want to come back and, and want to beat their score. Uh, so yeah, any, any questions? Uh, Eric, in terms of level of student, what are you, you mentioned, you know, college students, community college students. Could this also be valuable for graduate students who are just learning about data centers? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the level that he targeted, his target audience for this game was technicians uh, and undergraduate students. So that's, those are the two target audiences. So that's, he's kind of gearing it to that level and kind of sweeping a few things under the rug. But uh, in the future, we might, like, for somebody who's just starting to learn about this, they definitely, no matter what level they're at, if they have not been introduced to these ideas before, it would be useful for them to do it, to, to use the game, to learn about it. Uh, and also, we could make more advanced versions in the future of the game. <laughs> That's actually pretty easy to do. To this. Now that the game is built, you just unhide some of the things that you were sweeping under the rug <laughs> and make that a, more, a further complication that makes the game more, more, dip more difficult. You might even think that as that it's like an advanced version of the game or a level that's even harder. Uh, so yeah, I, I think I think the uh, it, it, you, you can tell it's a little bit this this game was a little bit more complicated than some of our other games that we're planning. It's a little more involved, but it is the replay value is pretty high because you can explore this whole space. Uh, so yeah, I, so I, I think we're we're excited to have the game be finalized and released. We're still we're still he's still tweaking everything, and then we're going to go through the polish phase and hopefully release sometime in June or late June or early July. Uh, after we release the game, then we're going to go through and have interview a bunch of the subject matter experts, maybe talking over the game or talking about the game. And we're going to have these video con this video content that will avail be available for students to 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 watch and, and and give them a little bit of context of what the game is trying to show them. Great. Uh, so that's the that's the first game that we have, and. Uh, we're, so yeah, and we're 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 hopefully gonna going to be. Uh, this is the old version. We're actually we we moved it to June July, uh, but uh, by October we hope to have all of our content up as well. So we hope to have all of our videos shot and put it all up on the edX platform. Uh, and so we're we're uh, that's this is what we're trying to shoot for for this year, uh, and just looking at the different games and modules that we're envisioning. So. Uh, this is the hyperscale data center game, the first one that we're building. Uh, we also have another game that we're going to create around uh, chemical and biological sensing. And that game will be a level-based game that will actually have two different modules. So we can use the same game in different contexts or, or like have different levels that explore different things. And so for this new game, what we're planning on doing is having uh, a whole module that where we have video content around chemical sensing and then the advanced, the like, like the third row of levels will all be on biological sensing, and so we'll have a separate module that will be have it, video content and have uh, 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 like a more of a focus on the biological sensing aspect of the game. Uh, so we, we, you can use the, even with a single game, you can use it for multiple purposes. And so, for instance, Anu, uh, and for that game, the the, the gas, the chemical sensing game. This is something that Anu, uh, if you're familiar with, with her course that she's building, she's building a sensing course. Uh, she's very excited. She's been involved as a subject matter expert through the whole development process and is very excited to include it in her course. So we're gonna we're planning on doing A-B testing with her course where some students will get the game in the very beginning of the course, other students will get it towards the end. So we'll have two different cohorts and the cohort that has it in the beginning, we're going to see if that actually increased their motivation. Do they have a, more, a higher likelihood of completing the course, or did they get more out of the course and perform better? So we're we're actually setting up uh, uh, some some research around the efficacy, or the at least the motivational efficacy of the of these games to uh, ha have students complete courses and also whether they perform better. Uh, and so so our, this is this is a game being uh, designed and created by IRFA, another game designer at Education Arcade, and again produced with Firehose Games. And so uh, for this game, if I go to it here, 
uh, it, it's in, it's not as completed, so <laughs> there's still a few bugs and a few things that are, that are we're working out. Uh, but for this game, the, it's more of a level-based game where for each level that you choose, you have some objective that you're trying to achieve, and you're and it gives you an introduction text and it, it asks it tells you how like what you're trying to to do with that level. And so for the first levels, it'll just be like build a circuit. <laughs> so here we're, we're having them actually build out an optic uh, a, a integrated photonic circuit. Uh, and so you you have an edge coupler that you attach to your optical fiber. You can then have a splitter that you put, and then you split the path into two different, uh, you split the light into two different waveguide paths. Uh, you can create, you can have two spirals, one that you put above and one that you put below. Uh, and so through the game, they'll learn like how to build their circuits starting from very basic to a little bit more advanced. Uh, and uh, one of the key features of the game is that you need to be able to expose certain elements in your circuit to the environment. So you want to expose maybe this bottom path to your environment, maybe code it in cryptophane or some other uh, coding that encourages it to methane to attach to the to the to the waveguide. Uh, and then once you do that, you have your detector. You put your photo detector down, uh, and then you need a light source, so you go to the circuit board. So it shows like here's here's the actual like uh, PCB printed circuit board that you're going to be using. You can design your circuit board with a, a laser source, and then go back and and to, onto your chip, uh, and then we'll, 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 we're having we're allowing them to also test the structure. So you can go through multiple rounds of testing on your own to figure out like what's working, was it what isn't working, and then when you click test, that you can test with methane present or without methane present if you're trying to detect methane. Uh, and so you can see like this is uh, a situation where I've completed a circuit that had a very different uh, power at the end. So in the end, a lot of the methane absorbs the light as it travels through this, this spiral structure. And as it's absorbing the light, if at the end you can see that one path, your reference path had no, like 3.6 milliwatts and your, and, you, uh, and your photo detector, and then your, uh, the, the sensing path, the path that actually had methane present, that one had 0.1 milliwatts. Well, that's showing you that there was absorption of that of your of your uh, light during that second path. And so they can they can hover over these things and see, okay, what happened to the power during this step? What happened to the power during this step? They can look at the specific what what are the losses and what are they, what does it show? So we're not trying to recreate the EPDA uh, commercially available so like software vendor tools. We are much more trying to create a scaffolded kind of approach that helps, that guides students through the process and lets them explore in a kind of limited, safe area where they they don't get lost in like the the difficulties of actually like creating a realistic uh, circuit simulation. So a lot of this is just it, on the back end we have uh, uh, models and we have uh, uh, lookup tables, but really the focus is much more on making it very uh, simple to use and easy to to create your circuits and then test them. Uh, so, so, and and, and uh, just on the aspect of a simulation versus a game, like this is going more a little bit towards a simulation. So, we think uh, like the the kind of difference here is a procedural simulation is something that just is like in the in digital environment that shows you step by step what to do, uh, and and it's kind of open ended. Where or or maybe it's just an open ended environment where you can do whatever. Think like a like Lego blocks. Like if you, Lego blocks are not a game, they're a toy. And so, if you think about on the opposite extreme. Uh, a game is something that gives you objectives that maybe is like scaffolded by the game designer, so they can like make sure that you're like, like all, all, all following a specific path. Something that has uh, it, you, it might be a place, that, uh, an environment that you can explore, but it also is an it's something that like where you can choose objectives or or, or goals that are that are rewarded within the system. So so uh, we are trying very much to make it more of a fun game and less of a like simulation tool. And in that way, help students kind of learn about the process in this environment. And then after that, they can move off into the software vendor tools and then design their own circuits uh, if they'd like to. Uh, questions? That's a lot of information, I know. <laughs> so, sorry, the, these, these games are a little bit complicated when you haven't gone through the, the introduction levels. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so we're, we're, we're quite excited to have this game be included in Anu's course, and we're going to hopefully get a lot of feedback from the users about whether it was useful to them or not. We are going to have surveys. So we're going to definitely try to see whether we're actually achieving 
our, the learning objective. So in this one, in this game, it's a lot more direct instruction where we're literally going to teach them how do you do index sensing? How do you do absorption sensing? Like, how do you design your circuits as you're trying to achieve certain outcomes? Uh, and so it, it's I, I, in this case, while it's more it's lit more linear and it won't be as replayable, it's yes. it's definitely going to try to like get them to design their own circuits uh, in a low barrier to entry way. Eric, Eric? Mm -hmm. is is this going to be in the current pick sensors course? It is whenever the revision, the second revision. So we're not going to have it ready by the time Anu releases, but whenever it's revised, we'll add like we'll add this to the course. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know what about the. I ha we haven't talked to IBL about revisions, but uh, the I, I think the goal is that maybe I think it's like six months of the normal time when you revise a course, or there's some like waiting period. Uh, um, whenever yeah, you I, you decide. Right. If it's an asynchronous course, we talk we with potentially them. we could potentially upgrade it at any point whenever we're ready to release it on on the on the on the, uh, uh, on the OpenEdX platform. Uh, okay. So yeah, that's that's the the second game. Uh, still in production, so some of the things are are like we're going to add features as we go, uh, and so that's the end of the presentation for this project, the virtual manufacturing lab project. But I wanted to quickly introduce you to some other things that we're thinking about, and other areas where we might be working in the future. So this is more a pitch for uh, uh, ways in which we're envisioning we can use educational games in our curricula. And really, what we're what, in multiple meetings that I've attended recently, uh, uh, Alexis Vogt and some other people have commented on the fact that uh, math is actually a barrier to entry for technicians trying to take optics uh, 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 optics courses or optics uh, uh, curriculum. And so, when they're trying to get a degree as an optics technician, they're actually like failing the math credit <laughs> and then dropping out of the of the of the curriculum completely. Uh, and so this is something that uh, I think, and we uh, just as background, like technicians are definitely, for at least for optics, <laughs> technician shortage is a huge problem. We have a huge skills gap. We have a bunch of problems that arise from having a shortage of technicians where they have to be trained on the job almost from scratch, or they have, or you have to have engineers sort of filling in and doing some of the work that technicians would do, which is kind of limiting their output as well. So there's a lot of uh, the currently a lot of problems around optic technician shortages, uh, and so when we thought about what exactly is causing what uh, math is hard for 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 everybody and even people who 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 like are good at math like trying to learn something new in math is a little is is a, is a challenging effort and a high barrier to entry. But we we feel like in a lot of ways what what what's probably going on in these in these. Uh, uh, in these courses is that they're coming in and they're trying to start from scratch with some basics of mathematics. And if anyone's feeling their heart race looking at the screen right now, that's exactly what a technician who's or a, a, a associate degree uh, uh, student would be feeling as they are back in, the, in an environment where maybe in K through 12, maybe that wasn't their favorite subject. <laughs> and so this is, this is the thing that we're trying to, uh, we're thinking about how to address. And using games for math is nothing new. This has been actually an area where educational games have had a lot of success in the past. Uh, but one thing that we're thinking about doing is we're thinking about trying to create like some uh, educational games that are geared towards whatever uh, uh, whatever like final job the the student might might uh, be doing. So in this case, if they're in an optics uh, technician training program. We might want them to, in their math in their math credit, we might want them to actually learn math through optics or learn math in a way that's leading and showing them how that's going to lead to optics. So this is we, we're we're envisioning that we could, uh, in in some new uh, project that we might pitch, we could uh, figure out exactly what, what math skills are needed that are in the different fields. And so if we're looking at at optics, it might be uh, understanding Snell's law. There might be some things that you need to know in order to in order to uh, do certain uh, uh, derivations or uh, use certain equations. And so we're planning on having uh, a, a, a look at all these different games that we might create. So we could include some of the games we've already made for our first project about optics specifically, but we could also create new games that are more focused on geometry or on algebra or other subjects 
that can be fun and engaging, but also geared towards the application areas that we're interested in, that, that the technician students would be interested in because it applies directly to their, the job that they're gonna be doing in the future. And so uh, we have a, a uh, we've been talking to uh, multiple people at MIT and we would definitely be using our, our, our connections to the Education Arcade and other, and other groups on campus. But we have uh, some ideas about the properties that these uh, these curricula based around educational games might have. So math grounded in applications. So if we want to do optics or robotics or materials, whatever it is, make it like clear that the course is focused on those areas. Uh, one idea that I have been pitching is like maybe when we create these STEM games, they need to be a bit more modular. So maybe you have like a tutorial, but then after that, you can jump into any of these different tracks. And those different tracks might be useful for different uh, instructors at different times. So they don't have to, like if you, if you want to use a game, you can have like the exact same game mechanics be used multiple times through the curriculum and you can just choose, pick and choose where to include like levels one and through whatever, uh, or, or you, can, you can like use different sections of the game for different purposes. Uh, another thing that we can think about is abstraction of mathematical concepts. So uh, instead of hitting them with, a, with, what, with the like equations on the board, getting their heart rates up, looking at all these <laughs> variables, maybe instead mathematics is much more about like concepts than it is about the terminology that you're using or the or the like uh, uh variables that you're using so you could think about having like the angles represented by color or uh, some other like introductory uh more friendly way to view some view some concept and in the end the math that you're doing is the same if you're solving a geometry proof using color you're actually doing the exact same thing as you would with with the variable x but maybe it's just a little bit more approachable uh and so the other, the other thing we wanted to do in the curriculum is not something that's necessarily game related, but promoting growth mindset, making sure that the, the curriculum itself is, is very focused on uh, kind of addressing the fact that they might have a math aversion and may, maybe promoting the growth mindset within that, that curriculum, uh, redefine their math identity <laughs> and kind of like help them see like learning about knots is also math. Learning about uh, like symmetry groups it doesn't necessarily need to include all these all, uh, numbers and equations it, you can think about that just like uh spatially and maybe spatial reasoning is another math skill uh, and then build math intuition using con kind of a conceptual understanding rather than a terminology or like instead of memorizing formulas or, or memorizing how to use like, like some algorithm to use the for uh, some formula they're kind of we're, we're, we're going to hopefully be moving them towards more of a conceptual understanding of of, of like the fundamentals of the concepts that they would use in their in their everyday lives as technicians. So this is just a, a small pitch for this new direction that I think we, we might want to go in in the future with educational games uh, uh, as part of this project or a future project. Uh, any questions? Eric, this has been wonderful. I'm yeah, happy. I'm happy. I'm right always excited to share. <laughs> and I always love seeing more details and new angles of what you're doing. So I really appreciate it. Yeah, and I'm happy to answer any follow-up questions by email. Feel free to email me. Uh, Julie can send out my email address. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, 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 if any, if you know of anybody else who's interested in this, we're currently thinking about funding sources for this type of work. And also for year three of our project, we're thinking about which manufacturing USA institutes to, to target for, for the year three SIMS. So we're very happy to reach out and, and work with uh, at any other MUSA Institute or any other funding source. And just so everyone is aware, I think there will be an upcoming EWD meeting of all the institutes where Clemson and Eric present their work just to encourage all the institutes to think about virtual reality and game-based learning. So um, when we learn more about that, we'll let you know, but it is something that seems to be gaining attention. Yeah, this is great work. This is really good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we're, it, it's quite exciting to move uh, into this space. My background is in optics uh, uh, research. So I was, I was working on photovoltaics before my background is physics. And so we're, and this is a very multidisciplinary activity. So we have game designers, we have artists, graphical art designers, we have uh, software developers actually coding up and using, using our platform of Unity 3Ds. Like there, there's all these different groups that are all coming together. So it's, there's all, you can't, you're not gonna be an expert in, 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 in like uh, all of it at once. So you're always gonna need a whole team.
team of different uh, disciplines coming together. Nice. That's great, Eric. Thank you. And I will share it with the rest of the people who missed it today. I know I think a lot of them would be interested in seeing it. So I'm going to stop the recording because <laughs> I think yours is uh, 